Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew 27, uh, if you would, please. Matthew 27. The goal of the message this morning uh, is to lift up the cross of Jesus Christ. So I was thinking to myself, man, what is this cross here laying down for? You know what we really need is we need some people to sort of stand this up. Can you kind of come and help me? And let's get this thing up in the air here. We just need a couple of people who are willing to, I don't know how long we'll need you, I think probably for a long time. And uh, let's just get this stood up. Uh, The goal of the message, uh, the Apostle Paul said, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of Jesus Christ. God forbid that I should boast in anything other than the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross is the signature symbol of the central event in the history of civilization. And the goal of the message this morning is to lift up the cross of Jesus Christ. Not until Constantine in the fourth century was the cross allowed as a symbol of Christianity. Constantine actually had a dream and it kind of terrified him and so uh, he forbid the cross as a means of execution and then it became a symbol of Christianity. C.S. Lewis has pointed out Uh, that uh, crucifixion was never a part of painting, never a part of sculpture. Crucifixion was never a part of art until everybody who had ever seen one had died off. Artists today, of course, depict the cross and merchandisers pounded into various forms of jewelry. Baseball players cross themselves before they go to the plate. And uh, department stores even have chocolate crosses uh, during Holy Week. Uh, No, no. Uh, That's not it at all. And what we want to do this morning is get a fresh view of what the cross of Jesus Christ is all about. It's the resurrection of Christ that changes history, but it's the cross of Christ that shows us the grace of God. Christ on the cross, a picture of grace. Now, I can't get that across to you, but I believe the Lord can. And so I'm going to take a moment and pray with you uh, before we get into God's Word. Let's all bow uh, together in a word of prayer. Father, uh, we thank you this morning for the privilege of coming before you. And it's only because of your cross that we can even call you Father or approach your throne of grace with boldness. And so we pray this morning, Lord, that you would uh, help us and cause this symbol so often misunderstood and, and, uh, and ridiculed, cause it to be elevated in our hearts and in our minds that the greater worship might be yours and the greater belonging to you and your cross might be ours. This we pray in the Precious name of Jesus, amen. How's it going, boys? You're holding up the cross? All right, just sit tight, all right? We're holding up the cross this morning, and I want you to look at this passage of Scripture, Matthew 27, one of the places in the four Gospels where the cross of Christ is taught about. I'm going to show you four things here, specific things. Uh, Let's start here, Christ on the cross, substituting. You say, what's this about exactly, and what's Jesus doing up there? Well, what's going on exactly? Substituting. That's what's going on. And notice in uh, Matthew 27, verse 15, it says, Now at the feast, uh, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. Remember, there was a civil war going on in the nation of Israel. Uh, The Romans were occupying, and now it was Passover, the number one, kind of like our Christmas and New Year's combined, like the number one feast of the year, and all of the people were in the streets, And, uh, of course, as the Civil War was going on daily, they were capturing people and putting them in prison. And there were insurgents in the streets of Jerusalem. And they would capture them once a year at Passover to sort of appease the people. They're like, well, all right, we'll give you one back. And are you happy now? No, we're not happy, was the answer. It was a lot of turmoil, but that's what leads to verse 16. And they had a notorious, notorious means famous for being evil. And they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Now, Pilate wanted to release him. The reason he wanted to release him, well, really, who who did he want to release? He wanted to release Jesus, so he took the worst possible person, the one about whom he was sure that they would all say, no, 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 don't give us him. And he said, well, what if I give you him? Thinking that somehow he could get off the hook with condemning the innocent Christ, verse 17. So when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, who do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? He might as well have said in our parlance, who do you want, BTK or Jesus? Who do you want back, son of Sam or Jesus? Of course, he understood it was because, see verse 18, it was out of envy, the religious leaders, right? It was out of envy that they had delivered him up. 
Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, saying, have, she had this dream. She was like, have nothing to do with that, that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him in a dream. So his wife was stressed out, worrisome. He was stressed out. Verse 20, now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus. The word destroy there means to annihilate, to eradicate, to erase not just his person, but even the remembrance of his name. We're, we're wiping him out, Jesus, like he never existed and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to destroy uh, Jesus. It's interesting if you peek over at verse 38, it talks about the two robbers who were crucified with Jesus. Now, when it says robbers, okay, it's not talking about burglars. It's not talking about, oh, dang, we left the back door open. The, you know, that's not what it is at all. People who, actually, the term translated there, robbers, in Matthew 27, 38, uh, means literally revolutionaries. And these were the insurgents who were crucified, one on either side of Christ. And... Uh, it's interesting because without question, Barabbas, the most notorious of all of them, was destined for that center cross. And so we are not stretching it in any way, shape, or form when we say Jesus literally died in the place of Barabbas. He was substituted for him. And Pilate said to them, or first of all, the governor said again, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, then, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And they, he said, well, why? Well, what has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. Now listen, you're beginning to understand the gospel when you understand this. What, what would have gone through Barabbas' mind as he realized that Christ was being substituted for him? The execution date was set. He knew uh, his time and his place to die. He was awaiting it. And all of a sudden, at the 12th hour, someone else is taken out of the cell. And, he's, and to find himself in the streets, and here I am, and, and I, I've been let free. I'm sure a lot of people were sort of staying away from him. And, but he was out and on his own, and Jesus was substituted for him. Now, here's what you have to understand. I am Barabbas, all right? You are Barabbas. We all stand in a long line of which Barabbas is number one. And then eventually comes you and comes me. I am the one who has broken God's law. I am the one who has failed to meet God's standard. I am the one who should have died. What's that cross doing there? And what's Jesus doing on that cross? I'll tell you what he's doing. He's substituting. He's dying in Barabbas' place and in your place and in my place. That is the essence of the gospel. Jesus in my place. He's substituting. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. All right. The Second Corinthians five twenty one says he became sin for us who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That's the gospel substitution. Can you say that? What's the word? Jesus died in our place. Substitution. Here's the second thing. Make a note of this. Scandalizing. What's he doing up there? He's making a scene, that's what he's doing. He's scandalizing, and by scandal I mean an outrageous offense. Regardless of the vantage point of the cross, those who love the Lord, those who hate the Lord, the fact that the second person of the Trinity died on a cross is an outrageous scandal. And you see that clearly as you continue through Matthew 27. To Pilate, so smug and self-assured, the over-the-top crowd was unsettling him, verse 24. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, what's all the upset? Why is everyone just like, ah! Because it's Jesus Christ. Because it's God. Because it's the central point in the history of civilization. Every force now converging at this place, the cross of Jesus Christ. When he saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water, washed his hands before the crowd, and said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. And it has been. The Jews rejecting Christ, choosing to crucify him, the most shameful, painful, awful death imaginable. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. <laughs> then he released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. 
Now watch the scandal continue. I'm going to go verses 27 through 44, but I'm just going to read to you what they did to Jesus. Verse 27, they gathered the whole battalion before him, 600 soldiers. They stripped him, twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. Kneeling before him, they mocked. The word mocked there means to make look like a fool. They spit on him, verse 30. They struck him. They stripped him of the robe. Verse 32, verse 34 says, they offered him wine uh, to drink mixed with gall. That was a narcotic to dull the pain. Jesus refused it. And then it says, verse 35, they crucified him. Verse 39, they derided him. Further verbal abuse. Save yourself. He saved others. He cannot save himself. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Scandalizing. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, creator, sustainer of the universe. Hey, hey, why all the anger? Why, why the venomous, outrageous, irrational hatred of Jesus Christ? It's really not so much different in our day, is it? Isn't it the very same? I mean, you can stand for a lot of things in our world, and people are like, well, dude, if that's your thing. But you stand for Jesus Christ. Watch people come out of their chairs. What is wrong with you? Why so bent? Why so upset? Because, listen, this is the battle of the ages, and the cross is the central thing in the history of civilization. Just this right here, the cross. Hey, guys, we need it higher. Why don't you get it up on the first step there? All right? The central thing in human history. Why the outrageous, irrational anger? I was, uh, about 10 days ago, I was invited back to the White House again for one of those presidential briefings we've gone to. When will we ever have a president who's interested in meeting with 30 or 40 pastors of churches? When will that ever happen again? And so back we went uh, to Washington. This, I think this was the fourth or fifth time. This was one of the times where the president got busy and didn't show. It's kind of hard to complain about that, but we had some amazing staff members this time in his place who came and reported on various things. One of the things they talked about was this Henrietta Myers, the new uh, nominee to the Supreme Court. It was just the day after the president had nominated her. The news wasn't out about her yet, but they told us on the side, she is a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. She attends a gospel preaching, Bible believing church in Dallas. I talked to a pastor from that area who knows that church very well. She was converted in the early 80s and she loves the Lord. Uh, the man who knows and is on the inside of it all said to us, she is everything that the evangelical church has been praying for for 30 years, all right? And, and, and how do you explain that? I mean, how do you explain the out, you wait, you watch what's going to happen in the press. You watch, and as it unfolds, as this all comes out over the next weeks and over the next couple of months, you watch the hatred. You watch the venomous, irrational, uh, hard to comprehend, really, anger. Why, why, why? Because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Foolishness and offense to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Watch the battle of the ages unfold before your eyes. And it's not just in the news. It's in our neighborhood. Uh, back where Kathy and I uh, used to live, uh, there was a neighbor on one side who, a nice family, they had a little boy, and, and the problem was, was that he just, for some reason, just like 10 years old, just loved to take the Lord's name in vain. Just Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, all the time. Well, you know, I, it's not really my responsibility to uh, say something to other people's kids Unless, you know, they're on my porch. <laughs> and and uh, so one day I had, I had to kind of say to him, you know, you know we love Jesus Christ and, and he's everything to us. And you really shouldn't say his name like that. And, and, and he loves you too. And, and uh, well, anyway, his parents weren't very happy when they heard that I had been so harsh with him. <laughs> and, and so, you know, we tried to work this out. It, it never really ever after years, got really, f why, why the uh, irrational anger? Why the, why the passionate, hot pursuit uh, to call down the name? Uh, my daughter uh, saw that little boy years and years later uh, on a school bus, walked right over to her years later. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. He hadn't even forgot it. How do you explain this irrational, vitriolic anger? It's scandalizing. Jesus is the miracle of the ages. He is the battleground for the souls of men. 2,000 Easter's later, Jesus dying is still scandalizing. 
What's he doing there? He's substituting. He's scandalizing. Of course, he's suffering. Let there be no mistake about that. Jesus is suffering. Look at Matthew 27, 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, and of course there was confusion about what he meant, but the others said, let's wait and see whether Elijah will come and save him. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Look back to verse 35. And when they had crucified him, and when they had crucified him, and when they had crucified him, words cannot come close to detailing the suffering of Christ on the cross. Isaiah 58 says that they pulled his beard out. Isaiah 52, 13 says, literally, so marred was his form that his appearance was not that of a man. In a word, excruciating was the cross. Do you know where the word excruciating comes from? It actually means literally, out of the cross, Latin, out of the cross, the symbol of great suffering. The passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's movie, toned down, really, the suffering of Christ. Frederick Farrar in his book, The Life of Christ, says this, listen, a death by crucifixion seems to include all that pain and death can have of the horrible and ghastly, dizziness, cramp, thirst, starvation, sleeplessness, traumatic fever, shame, publicity of shame, long continuance of torment, horror of anticipation, mortification of intended wounds, all intensified just up to the point at which they can be endured at all, but all stopping just short of the point which would give the sufferer the relief of death. One thing is clear, the first century executions were not like the modern ones, for they did not seek a quick, painless death, nor the preservation of any measure of dignity for the criminal. On the contrary, they sought an agonizing torture which completely humiliated our Lord. It is important that we understand this, for it helps us realize the suffering in Christ's death. Interesting. Do you understand that the physical suffering is the smallest part of the cross? From all of the words that Jesus spoke on the cross, of all of the things that he said about relationships with he and others and he and God, only the brief phrase, I thirst, even touches on the physical component of the suffering of the cross. By far, by far, the great suffering of the cross was the incomprehensible separation in the triune Godhead. That's why Jesus finally cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 46. What infinite, incalculable, who can comprehend separation in the inseparable, forsaken by a father of infinite and lasting love. It would be one thing for Jesus to be forsaken by the uh, pagan people around the cross headed for hell apart from God's intervention. It's one thing for Jesus to be forsaken and abandoned by the weak-willed disciples who followed at a distance. But who cannot comprehend God the Father himself causing the sky to go black and turning somehow his back? Who can comprehend exactly what is happening? But understand that is the focal point of the suffering. Now stop. How quickly we could rush past that point. The Gospels do not. Three chapters at the beginning of Matthew cover 30 years of Jesus' life, his birth, his growth to manhood. 22 chapters cover his three-year ministry. But then three whole chapters are devoted just to the final week of his life and two of those chapters to the final three days, focusing where? Where is the focus in all of Scripture? Where is the focus in all of the Gospels? Where is the focus at the close of the Gospels? Tell me where it is. It's at the cross. It's at the cross. This is it. This is the defining moment in human history. What is the second person of the Trinity doing on a cross? He's substituting. He's scandalizing He's suffering. Now listen, this last thing. You don't understand the gospel if you don't understand this. You don't get it yet if you don't have this last thing. 
What's he doing? He's satisfying. That's what he's doing. He's satisfying. Notice in verse 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. We learned last year in our study of Hebrews that the Holy of Holies was the place where the priest could only go once a year. It's where God's presence dwelt. It was the symbol of fellowship and relationship with God. And here at this final moment, when Jesus hung his head and gave up the spirit and died, right in that moment, what happened? That temple veil was torn, and not from bottom to top like some guy was standing there thinking, I, should, I think we should take this down. Like God himself, from top to bottom, tore it open and said, come on in now. The way is open to personal, lasting fellowship with the creator of the universe. Why? Because of what Christ accomplished on the cross. Satisfying. God said, I am satisfied. A holy God said, sin has been paid for. It has been dealt with. It has been set aside. And if you will embrace my son by faith, the way is open for you to come into my presence. Notice the emblems of God's satisfaction. The temple veil is torn. The earth shook and rocks split. Where? Everywhere. God literally took hold of the earth and shook it. Rocks split open. The natural order of birth, life, and death was reversed. This is amazing. Look, God's sending a message. The tombs also were opened. (laughs) And the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised Isn't that outrageous? And there's the people, it's like the original thriller. And people are walking around the streets. Look, look, look. The saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Uh, Who are you? Yeah, well, I was uh, dead and, um, and I'm back now because of the cross. Because Almighty God set aside the natural order for a moment and miraculously reached down and shook the earth and emptied the tombs. Something's happened. The universe will never be the same. Sit up and pay attention. The cross of Jesus Christ. Who can comprehend the holy infinite anger that God has over sin? Can you comprehend that? You think about all the things that we've done all the things that we've said and done. Who can comprehend God's holy indignation over sin? Think of your sin in mind and how God loathes it. Think of every act of cruel barbarism that sickens the stomach into a knot. Think of the awful things you've seen done and done to others. Think of every act of perversity measured out in this moment against innocence rising like a stench into the nostrils of God and think of all of God's anger and all of God's indignation and all of God's hatred for all of that sin poured out where? Tell me where. Up a step, boys. Poured out where? Poured out upon the cross of Jesus Christ. Poured out upon him. On him almighty judgment fell that would have sunk the world to hell. On Jesus And when Jesus said, it is finished, God said, paid in full, paid in full. It's enough. You can be forgiven. That's the awesomeness of the cross of Jesus Christ. What's he doing there? Substituting, scandalizing, still, isn't that right? Suffering, and best of all, satisfying the demands of a holy God. All right, on to application. Let's spell these boys off. Who wants to come up and hold up the cross now? Come on, men and women, four of them, we need you. Come on. Perfect. Come on. Five is good. Next time, sit right here on the steps. You guys are next. Come on, sit right here. I like the idea we have shifts. Sit right here. Come on, you're next. Sit right here. You're going to have a chance. All right, now listen to God's word. Take that up a step. We're lifting up the cross, amen? God forbid that I should glory in anything other than the cross of Jesus Christ. Christ on the cross, a picture of grace, 
a picture of grace. Do you know about grace? Do you know about grace? Unearned, unmerited, undeserved, unwarranted grace. God doesn't give paychecks. Did you know that? God doesn't give paychecks. God gives gifts. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. It's called grace. And all God's people said, grace. It's called grace. Let's talk about that for a moment. Would you turn with me? Would you take the time to turn with me to four passages? Let's let's look at grace. Christ on the cross. Four pictures of grace. First of all, Colossians 1. Let's get over there. Make that lovely sound I love to hear. Make it. Oh, I love that. Bible pages turning. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 says this. Speaking of Jesus, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. You listening? He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. I'm not tired of reading that yet. What has Jesus done? He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Apart from Christ, we belong to the kingdom of darkness. Apart from Jesus Christ, where would you be this morning? Let me tell you where you would be. You would be in some awful place. You would be in the world. You would be wallowing in sin. You would have no hope. No, you'd be without God and without hope in this world apart from Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. What did you do to earn that? Why, how come you get to know Jesus? What exactly was so special about you that your eyes would be open to the gospel? Hold up the universal symbol for what's special about you. Correct. The answer is nothing. Turn to your neighbor and just tell them there's nothing special about you. All right? There's nothing special about you. True or false? Am I preaching truth? This is the truth. There is nothing in us. God didn't say, well, you are a little cuter than most of the people I've set eyes upon. God didn't say that. God didn't say, well, you know, as I think about it, you're a little more righteous than some. I think you're a little more to the goal. I'll pick up with you. Not at all. In fact, the Bible indicates quite the opposite. He who is forgiven much loves much. Some of us are the worst there ever was. Amen? You think that's more about the guy sitting beside me, but I'll say amen if I have to. (laughs) How wrong you are. The storm of God's wrath was coming upon us, and like the urban poor of New Orleans, we were trapped with no way out until Christ stepped in and led us to high ground. All right, Colossians 1 says, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Notice, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Redemption. That means that a price was paid. A price was paid for our forgiveness, all right? This isn't some free thing. This isn't some pampering God. Oh, Billy, have another cupcake. Have some more icing, Billy. Not God. A price was paid for forgiveness. That's the cross of Jesus Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood. He paid a price so that we could be forgiven. That's the gospel. He paid a price. Redemption pictures Christ's death as payment to God. He claims us from the kingdom of darkness. Our sin is not held against us. Do you have any idea how bankrupt we were without the cross of Jesus Christ? Do you have any idea how completely unable we were to do anything to appease this holy God? When I was in college, I was so poor. I didn't have what do they say? Two cents. I didn't have two cents. I'm telling you, I, I had nothing. I was driving this old kind of broken down car home one night to my parents' house. I didn't even live in dorm because I didn't have the money to live in dorm. And I was driving home late at night. I got stopped by the police. I know that surprises you, but I did. And <laughs> it, was because, it was because I had a taillight out and he pulled me over and let me have your license and la, la, la. It was probably about 1 a.m. or something. And, and uh, he said... Uh, Came back to my car. He said, you know, you have some, tra- some uh, parking tickets. You haven't paid them. To which I thought to myself, yeah, and the reason I haven't paid them is because I don't have any money. But I didn't say that. I just said, oh, yeah, yeah. I, um. He said, well, do you have any money on you now? I didn't have one cent in my wallet. I had nothing. I, he said, well, do you have a credit card? Yeah, yeah right. 
Thank God I didn't have a credit card. I didn't have, I had nothing. He said, well, I'm sorry. You're, you're going to have to come with me. Car in park, lock the doors, into the cruiser, driving to the police station, very late at night. Somehow I was able to persuade him to stop by the Bible college dormitory. So there with his big flashlight and his gun at his waist, we're into the dormitory, 1 a.m. First bed I went to, Pastor Rick Donald's bed. <laughs> he had four dollars. Okay. I scrounged around, scrounged around. Finally, finally, I was able to pull together from all of the people. I had just enough. Well, here I am. I didn't go to prison. Listen, do you know what it's like to have nothing, to have a debt that has to be paid and have absolutely nothing with which to pay it? That is our condition before the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the situation of every person born into this world, bankrupt before a holy God. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, grace that redeems, the penalty is gone. Oh, I love this. Grace that releases, the power is gone. A lot of people understand about the forgiveness of sins, they have the fire insurance, they're going to heaven and so on, but they don't understand sanctification. They don't understand what God wants to do in their life before they get there. Let's talk about grace that releases. Turn over for a second to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 verse 14 says, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Now if you only know the grace that redeems... If you only know the grace that redeems, you're like an astronaut in the space shuttle on the launch pad. If you only know the grace that redeems, that forgives sins, you're like a mountain climber at base camp, okay? There's so much that's up ahead of you, you you don't have that yet. That's why it says in Romans 6, 14, for sin will have no dominion over you. God doesn't want to just save us, he wants to change us. God doesn't just want to forgive us, he wants to transform us. This is the glory of the gospel. Not just people going to heaven, but people transformed to be like and to live like Jesus Christ here and now. You have to experience Romans 6, 14. Sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Let me ask you a question. Are you ever lazy? All in favor of truth-telling in church? (laughs) Are you ever lazy? Do you ever lust? Do you? Do you ever ever lie? (laughs) Do you ever lie in church about whether you lie? (laughs) Let's take another run at that. Are you ever lazy? Do you ever lust? Do you ever lie? And how exactly do you hope to resolve that problem? You say, when I think of, see, all the law can do is make you feel like, man, I, I lie, I lust, I'm la- a loser, loser, loser. That's all the law can do for you. Loser, loser, <laughs> loser. All right? That's all the law does for you. It just makes you feel like garbage. Just preaching the law all the time, it just makes people feel awful. All in favor of grace? He says, he says, look, look, here's the good news. Sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under law. You're under grace. You're under grace. Do you know what grace means? Grace means get up and try again. Grace means God's not done with you yet. Yeah, well, I'm done. No, you're not. Get up. All right? God's not done with you. Grace means there's a new opportunity. Oh, Pastor James, you don't know what I did this week. Get up. All right? And step on into the grace of God, not as an excuse to keep on sinning, but as a life of gratitude to say to God, Lord, you're so good, you're so faithful, I'm not. Help me. I want to be a man of purity. I want to be a woman of integrity. Grace that releases. That word dominion there means both official and functional authority. Sin shall have no dominion over you. Sin shall have no authority, functional authority. Positional authority is like I'm a policeman. Functional authority is gun out of holster, hand behind back, Bent over the car, that's functional authority. And when Romans 6, uh, 14 says, 
Sin shall not have authority over you. It, it, sin cannot tell you what to do. Sin cannot ring your bell anymore. If you're in Christ, you can choose to do what's right. You say, oh, Pastor James, that's been my life. I mean, every time sin says jump, I say how high. And, and, and I, okay, well, this is what it means to be in Christ. Now when sin says jump, you say shut up. All right? I don't have to do that anymore. I'm dead to that now. My life's not about that anymore. I am a new creation in Christ. I can live as God wants me to live. I have the freedom to choose. Why? Because of the power of the cross. All right? He whom the Son sets free. He whom the Son sets free. Jesus wants to set us free. Now, if you only have the forgiveness of sins part, if you only have the grace that redeems and you don't have the grace that releases, get on into all that God has for you. The power is gone. You don't have to do what sin and the law demands anymore. Now check this out. Grace that reconciles. So many things could have been chosen here, but turn quickly over to Ephesians chapter 2. I want to show you two more of these. Hey, get that cross up a little higher there. What's wrong with you guys? That's great. Notice in Ephesians chapter 2. Grace that reconciles. Grace that reconciles. Are you looking at Ephesians 2? Go to verse 14. It says, for he, that's Jesus he's talking about, for he himself is our peace. You're like, well, yeah, yeah, peace with God. No. More than that, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. All right? So making peace and might reconcile us both. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jews and Gentiles. Might reconcile both of us to God in one body through the cross. Look at it thereby killing the hostility. One of the things that the cross obliterates is all role distinction, all class distinction, all social distinction, all racial distinction. That's gone in the cross of Jesus Christ. All right? One of the things about worshiping in a community of believers is there ought to be people here together that don't work together, that don't live together, that don't go together according to the culture, but in Christ, the things that separate us are broken down. Is that right? I'll tell you, I'm from Canada, you know that. I grew up, I didn't have this, I didn't see this prejudice thing growing up. Like, like I, I'm telling, I just didn't see it. I, when my last year in high school, I, I did a, a term paper on prejudice. Unfounded, overgeneralized, stereotyped thinking formed without a solid assessment of the facts. That's prejudice. And, and uh, when I went my first year out of high school, I went to college in Tennessee. And uh, I wasn't ready for what I saw there. Well, my, I, my, I had a, a black guy, I wouldn't say African-Canadian. I had this, this black dude I hung out with in high school. He, he loved the Lord. I played basketball with him. He, he came to our church youth group and came to know Christ. He, we called him Big Ed. He was an amazing person, and he was one of my dearest friends. And I was not ready for what I met when I went to the South, let me tell you something. And I remember one night I was in a dormitory room. This still upsets me to think about it. I was sitting with a bunch of guys in the dorm and we were playing some silly game and someone made some popcorn and we were passing around this bowl and some guy came into the room, an African American, and I served him some popcorn and we kept talking and eating and I noticed after he left the room, he said, we're not putting our hand in that bowl again. It made me sick. I'm telling you, it, I only stayed there for one semester. I went back home. It was sick what I saw there. Listen, there ought to be something that causes a follower of Jesus to be repulsed by, by, by racial prejudice. It is great evil and wickedness. And let me just say that the growing racial diversity in our church is for the glory of Jesus Christ. And listen, listen, I've been to a lot of different places in the world where a person who looks like me is a minority. And I applaud those of you who are minorities in this part of the city, in this part of the country, who choose to come and worship with us. You are bringing glory to Jesus Christ. You are saying the things that separate people in the world need not separate us here. We are the followers of Jesus Christ. We have been brought together under what? Under the cross, and we are all one in him. Is that right? Amen. God help us. Grace that releases, the power is gone. Grace that reconciles. The prejudice is gone. Help us, Lord. 
And lastly, grace that removes. You say, James, my problem isn't my attitude toward other people. My problem is my attitude toward myself. I've done so many things in my life. I've been things. I'm so ashamed. I even sit here and I just feel like I don't belong here. I shouldn't be able to come here. If you knew what I'd done, if you knew where I'd been, hey, 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 hey. If you knew what we'd done, if you knew where we'd been, okay, grace that removes. Turn with me over to Colossians last time. Colossians chapter 2. Where's Colossians? It's in here somewhere. When I grow up, I hope I can preach and turn to the passage at the same time. <laughs> Colossians 2.13. It says, and you were dead in your trespasses. You were dead in your trespasses. God made you alive together in him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Here it is. By canceling the record. What did God do with the record? What did God do with my history? What did God do with my past? What did God do with all my failures that I constantly review? What did God do with them? He canceled them. Canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside. Huh, look at that. Nailing it to the cross. What did he do with it? Just nailed it to the cross. Lord, Lord, what are you doing with my past? I'm nailing it to the cross. Lord, what are you trying to tell me? Forgiven. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Washed away. That's the news of grace. Sometimes the biggest problem that we have is our own sense of failure and inadequacy and, and, and sinfulness and failure. I was reading again this week um, a book called The Whisper Test. In it, a woman, Mary Ann Bird, writes this. I grew up knowing I was different, and I hated it. I was born with a cleft palate, and when I started school, my classmates made it clear to me how I looked to others. A little girl with a misshapen lip and a crooked nose and lopsided teeth and garbled speech. When schoolmates asked me, well, what happened to your lip? I'd tell them I'd fallen and cut it on a piece of glass. Somehow it seemed more acceptable to have suffered an accident than to have been born different. I was convinced that no one outside my family could love me. There was, however, a teacher in the second grade whom we all adored. <laughs> Mrs. Leonard by name. She was short and round and happy. A sparkling lady. Annually, we had a hearing test. Mrs. Leonard gave the test to everyone in the class, and finally it was my turn. I knew from past years that we would stand against the door and cover one ear and the teacher would sit over at her desk and she would whisper something and we would have to repeat it back to her. Things like, the sky is blue or do you have new shoes? I waited there for those words that God must have put into her mouth. Those seven words that changed my life, Mrs. Leonard, Leonard said in her whisper, I wish you. God says to every person ashamed of their past, I wish you were mine. I wish you were mine. God is not willing that any should perish. The grace of God says that all can come to repentance. And Colossians chapter 2 tells us, what has Jesus done with our sin? Tell me, what's he done? He's nailed it to the cross. Some of you say, James, my life feels like this. I, I, I'm not old enough to be giving up, but i got to tell you, there's so many wrong things written on my life, I wonder if anything right can ever be written. There's so many things that I would do differently, I would choose differently, I would go differently, I would spend differently, I, I would do it so differently, and there's so much that I would change. And you feel like, my life is like this. Listen, grace says that God takes all of those things that we would change, and what does he do with them? Tell me, what's he do? That's where it goes. That's where it goes. And because of Christ on the cross, a picture of grace, we can begin again. And it is not too late, no matter how old you are, no matter where you have been. God on the throne, a picture of holiness. Sin in the mirror, a picture of brokenness. Self in the dirt, a picture of repentance. Ha <laughs> Now we're ready to revel 
in Christ on the cross, a picture of grace. Let's bow together in prayer.